I am coming to you with a sound of victory, a sound about the end times, a sound about the coming glory, the times we live in right now. I want to share a couple things with you, and I want to uh, make this an introduction for a message. I don't know how many parts this will be, but I want to get into some things about exactly the time we're living in now. This is 2011. October, and uh, there is much going on in the world, of course. Uh, seems like there always is, but um, so much is coming to a, uh, a, a intersection of time that all seems to meet right now, right in this season, for the last days. First, I want to examine what the Bible says just a little bit. In Mark 13, Jesus said, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not get alarmed, troubled, and frightened. It is necessary that these things take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and calamities. But this is but the beginning of intolerable anguish and suffering only the first of birth pains now he's not saying god's doing this he's not saying that this is uh something god gets joy in he's saying this is going to happen in the last days in luke 21 a uh, similar thing he said and when you hear of wars and insurrections disturbances disorder and confusion do not become alarmed and panic stricken and terrified for all this must first take place but the end will not be will not come immediately then he told them nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be mighty and violent earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences plagues malignant contagious or infectious epidemic diseases which are deadly and devastated De devastating and there will be sights of terror and great signs from heaven that's Luke 21 verse 9 through 11 again Jesus is not saying that that the father the heavenly father <clears throat> is sending this he's saying this is what's going to happen in the end times and it is a sign of the end times but we really need to listen to the part where he says, don't be alarmed. Don't be panic stricken. Don't get in fear. Don't let it rob you of your peace. That part is very important because when you lose your peace, you start thinking wrong. When you lose your peace, you start thinking out of your emotions. And God wants you to think out of your spirit. He wants to be able to still communicate with you without getting your soul in the way. Some other scriptures that are similar <clears throat> are in First uh, and Second Timothy. But the Holy Spirit distinctly and expressly declares that in latter times, some will turn away from the faith, getting it, giving attention to deluding and salute, seducing spirits and doctrines that demons teach through the hypocrisy and pretensions of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid people to marry and teach them to abstain from certain kinds of food, that includes vegetarians, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and have an increasingly clear knowledge of the truth. For it is howled, howled, howled. it is howled and consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. Every time I pray, every time my family prays, that word means it's sanctified, it's set apart before him. And, and we don't pray, when we pray over our food, we don't pray <clears throat> to just give, say, grace or um, just only to give thanks. Of course, we are extremely grateful. But what we're, what we're doing when we pray over our food is sanctifying it. We're saying, 
Father, we set this whole meal in front of you and we give thanks for it, but we also know, we ask that your hand touch it. What we're actually doing is transferring our meal spiritually over into the kingdom of God where God can, can put his hand on it so that <clears throat> anything uh, that would be harmful, dangerous, anything wrong with the meal, any spiritually, naturally, uh, we mix our faith with that and that's why we um, pray over our food. God says he gave that food so that you would, uh, your, your body would be blessed by it. If you lay all these instructions before the brother and you will be worthy, a worthy steward and a good minister of Christ Jesus, ever nourishing your own self in the truths of the faith and of good Christian instruction which you have closely followed. But refuse and avoid irreverent legends, profane and impure and godless fictions, mere grandmother's tales and silly myths, and express your disapproval of them. Train yourself toward godliness, piety, keeping yourself spiritually fit. For physical training is of some value, useful for a little, but godliness, spiritual training, is useful and of value in everything and in every way, for it holds promise for the present life and also for that which is to come. And the King James says that godliness is profitable. This saying is reliable and worthy of complete acceptance by everybody with a view to this we toil and strive, yes, and suffer reproach because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior, preserver, maintainer, deliverer of all men, especially of those who believe, trust in, rely on, and adhere to him. Continue, continue to command these things and to teach them. Well, that's what we're doing today. That's what we're doing on this video. <clears throat> that's 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 11. He's saying these are some of the things that are going to happen in the last days. For, uh, forbidding from Mary, for, forbidding from eating certain kinds of fruit, food. Um, all these special diets are a sign Restrictive diets, I believe in eating healthy, absolutely. But when you make it a, a mandate, when you force it, when you push it, when it's a driving thing, it's a sign of the end times. Let me read one more. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. But understand this, that in the last days will come perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered, lovers of money and aroused by inordinate greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhumane, relentless, ad admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of good. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements. Vain amusements. Kind of sounds like video games. Kind of sounds like wasting time in so many of the vain amusements. It's a sign of the times. More than and rather than lovers of God. For although strangers to the for although they hold a form of piety, true, true religion, 
They deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. They conduct belays and uh, con conduct belays and genuineness of their profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. For among them are those who worm their way into homes and captive, captivate silly and weak-natured and spiritually dwarfed women, loaded down with burden of their sins and easily swayed and led away by various evil desires and seductive impulses. These weak women will listen to anybody who will teach them, and they will forever. They are forever inquiring and getting information, but never able to arrive at a recognition and knowledge of the truth. Now, just as Janus and Jambres were hostile to the, to hostile to and resisted Moses, so these men also are hostile to and opposite and oppose the truth. They are depraved and distorted minds. They are reprobate and counterfeit and to be rejected as far as the faith is concerned. They will not get very far for they, for their rash folly will become obvious to everyone as was the, to those magicians mentioned. Now you have closely observed and diligently followed my teaching. Conduct purpose in life faith, patience, love, steadfastness, persecution, suffering such as occurred to me at Antioch, at Lystra. Persecutions endured, but out of all of them the Lord delivered me. <clears throat> I'll stop there. This is very obviously signs of the of the end times what paul is talking about here to timothy um there is so much that is dis i mean we feel it in our hearts we see it in the word but some still aren't going to believe it some still are going to laugh but that isn't that what the word said would happen now, I'm not trying to put a cloud of doom and gloom here. I'm trying to simply, I'm just reading the Bible. He did say that persecutions would come. He did talk about the sufferings of those times. But it seems like we're doing what Paul said right there. It seems like we have a form of godliness in so much of what's called the church, but we deny the power. Listen, if your church is denying the power of God, if it's running from the power, if it's afraid of displays of God's power, something's very wrong. You can go to church, but it's not, you're not going to church to do God a favor. You're going to be equipped. You're going to receive and be fed. You're going so that you can learn how to be fruitful and multiply, which is your, one of your biggest purposes on the earth. There's a reason that the things are happening in the world. Because the world, the Bible says, is going through some aches. It's having, the Bible calls it birth pains. The Bible, the Bible says that, <clears throat> that it's a display of evil in the last days. Now, where do you think that's coming from? See, we say, oh, suffering, and then we blame God. The Bible merely pointed out these things were happening. It didn't say God was doing them. I really wish that the church would remember there's a destroyer out there. Because if you forget that, you're not going to walk in the power. You're going to deny the power. And you're not going to gravitate to the power. You're going to gravitate to the suffering. You're going to learn how to be a really good victim. And unfortunately, we have leaders who are teaching the people how to be great victims. Because God's trying to work something in you. It's for this purpose. We never find out what the purpose is. And decade after decade, we're still looking for the purpose and still suffering and still trying to get this big lesson. Listen, suffering is not the teacher of the church. 
The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. The Bible and the Holy Spirit are the instructors of the church. <clears throat> How messed up are we to go decade after decade of suffering for some mysterious purpose? I thought that's what the blood of Jesus was for. I thought we were supposed to be getting into position as an end time army of more than conquerors and being equipped to be able to stand when these hard times come. I thought that's what it was all about. But whatever you give attention to will get bigger in you. So if you give attention to suffering, suffering will be on your mind. It will be on your lips. Suffering, suffering, constantly suffering. Constantly thinking about being a victim instead of a victor. You were made more than a conqueror, Romans 8 says. What does that mean? That means that you didn't have to fight the battle, the hard part. Jesus did that for you. And he handed you the victory and he said, now just simply enforce it. There'll be some effort to it. So what kind of suffering is approved? What kind of suffering can a Christian uh, see that it is something that's going to happen and they're just going to rest in God's arms when it does? Well, one of the most obvious ones is uh, persecution for the word's sake. Not persecution because you messed up, you made a mistake, you lied, you stole, you sinned, you made a bad judgment. Not persecution for that sake, but persecution for the word's sake. And the word is Jesus, and Jesus is the word the Bible says. So when you are expressing the word in your life, in your lips, you're doing the reason that you're on this earth, the purpose of you on this earth. And listen to me, you have a purpose. You have a call. You have a reason you're on, you're on this earth and you have a reason that you were placed in this time. Did you ever think about that? What it would probably all of us have, what it would have been like to be 100, 200 years, 1,000 years ago, uh, before Jesus came, a whole nother time. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about you and me and being on this earth right now. In, uh, if you look at the, uh, the time, the, the uh, population of the whole earth, since the very beginning of time, and they have graphs, you can go look at this on the internet, pretty easy to find. Since the beginning of time, the population of the entire earth is measured in billions. And all from the beginning of time, all the way through came to Jesus, and then all this time came up to the year 1800, the population of the earth finally hit uh, one billion. All that time, it's like a flat line if you look at it on a graph. Barely moving, finally hit 1800. That was just yesterday. Not that long ago, if you look at the, since the beginning of time. Finally hit 1 billion. Now, finally, in 1920, we hit a whopping 2 billion. This year, 2011, the earth population of the earth is going to hit 7 billion people. So the line goes like this. Now, the earth calls, the, the world calls that uh, population explosion, calls overgrowth. It, it panics because we're crowding the earth. What are we going to do? Uh, there's not going to be enough food. There's too many people. We need to start killing babies. We need to start uh, uh, killing sick people or, or, or whatever, weak people, whatever. Start to need, bring the numbers down, contain the population. The world panics at the thought of that. And the numbers are just going up. I mean, next year and one year after the other, it's exponential growth. What's going on? The world calls that overpopulation and freaks out. God calls it harvest. God is going to fill 
heaven with you and me and people like you and me and people that we told about Jesus. He's going to fill heaven. It's harvest time. I remember I said, there are so many things intersecting in this time. So many things coming together. I, I, this is just the introduction. I'm going to point out several. I'm going to get into some prophecies that were strategic in time and point out why I'm, com uh, why I'm bringing these prophecies up now. <clears throat> but we are in a critical moment. And God knows that. The church is supposed to know that. And the enemy knows that. So why are bad things happening? Why is there trouble in the earth? Well, why when, uh, when Jesus said to, to the one boy about with the head of, had a, um, that needed healing, went to cast out the devil, he spoke to the devil, went to cast it out, said, come out, and, it, and the devil threw him in the fire. He freaked out. <clears throat> where, where I am in part of the world, there is a lot of witchcraft. And there are people, including people that are supposed to be Christians, they end up going to witchcraft temples. <clears throat> and sometimes you're in the middle of preaching. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I went to tell one woman in the middle of preaching, Lord impressed on me to tell her that God loved her. That's all I said. And she started manifesting a demon. What did it look like? Well, she started to shake. Why is that? Because they tremble. It says the demons know it and tremble. They know God. They know his word and they know the time that we're in. Let me read something <clears throat> from a publication called The Latter Rain Evangel. This is from November 1911. That's exactly... One, from one month from now, it will be exactly to the month 100 years. And in this publication, they were the title of this part of the article is The Signs of the Times. And it talks about as is the days of as it is in the days of Noah, such are the words, the Lord's own words giving us a description of the state of things at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. It begins to talk about as the days of Noah that uh, people were marrying, giving in marriage. They didn't know. They were eating, drinking. It's party time. Where's the next party? Where's the next exciting thing? Where's the next uh, video game about to come out? Because I want to stand in line all night because I have to have it, uh, and I have to have it, you know, early. I have to have it the moment it comes out. Boy, we just get, we're just, we're just like sheep. We just run to some, and, and, and who doesn't love technology? Who doesn't love fun things? But remember the scripture I read says, when you love those things more than you love God, something's very wrong. It says in the days of Noah, they were doing all these things and they didn't even know when the flood came and took them away. says, before the Lord poured out this dreadful judgment upon the scene, he sent them many warnings of the fearful doom which awaited them, but they would not repent. And if we follow down through the ages, we find the same thing has taken place again and again. Now again, this is the latter rain evangel, November 1911. The Word of God is full of warnings intended for the days we are living in, but men do not give any heed to them. It is said that before the destruction of San Francisco by an earthquake, weeks before it happened, a poor woman who went about the city telling the inhabitants that God was going to send an earthquake to destroy it, they of course thought she was only an old fool. I wouldn't have phrased it that way, that God was going to send an earthquake to destroy it. But I'm just reading this article to you. They, of course, thought she was an old fool, and they gave no heed to her warnings. But the earthquake came, and San Francisco was destroyed, and many lives were lost. God's not the destroyer. 
the devil is. Let me, let me please make that clear. God is not the destroyer. He's the life giver. Before the destruction of Messina, which is in Italy, uh, I think, it seems that there was a, a warning given by F. Marion Crawford in the Outlook for April 1909. It says, There appeared in, in the city one of those wandering religious fanatics whom the Italians call Nazarenes, a bare-headed, half-starved, wild-eyed man dressed in a sort of hermit's frock. A boy of 12 or 14 by his side carried a cowbell. The two stopped always at the busiest corners, and the boy rang the bell as the public criers still do in old Italian towns. The man lifted up his voice shrill and clear to utter his prophecy. His wild eyes, eyes were suddenly still, and looking upward fixed them on the high houses opposite, and cried, Be warned, take heed and repent ye of Messina. This year shall not end before your city is utterly destroyed. I mean, you can get the picture. The guy was funny looking. He had this boy with him, and the boy's ringing a, cow, a loud cowbell. They look crazy. But what was he saying? Funny how some people look so weird, so funny, that we reject what they have to say instead of stopping and listening to their words. In these days, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to really tune your ear, your heart, your understanding into what's being said. No matter what the person looks like or what the sound is, I'm not saying a, a crazy man with looking, crazy looking man with a boy and a cowbell, but you never know. But listen what happened. But they who were to perish laughed and jeered at the Nazarene and went about their business. The editor of a paper called The Future, published then in Messina, went so far in his mockery and daring blasphemy that he published the following fearful challenge to Almighty God. The Almighty, this is his quote, the Almighty, if you are not an blank blank, I cannot print the blasphemous words, send an earthquake to prove you exist. The earthquake came the next day, and about 200,000 people perished in, fearful visitation, in the fearful visitation. A short time before the destruction of St. Pierre, which is uh, in France, it's in um, Martinique, an evangelist passed through the city, which was said to be the wickest, wickedest place on earth. He was willing to preach the gospel to them, but they did not want it. There was also a faithful Roman priest who warned them often that judgment would fall upon them unless they repented. But to, to all of this, they, feared, they turned a deaf ear. It is said that a short time before the city was destroyed, the citizens took a pig into the open square and crucified it in derision of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was one street in that city that was a perfect hell upon earth for immorality, blasphemy, and corruption of the lowest kind. One day, the end of it all came. In less than 30 seconds time, 40,000 people, that's what the article said, as I have researched this, the numbers vary a little bit, uh, depending on which article you, you read, were launched without mercy into eternity. And their city was completely wiped off the face of the earth. All except a few smoking ruins, which now lie desolate, filled with ashes and charred bones of those who lie buried beneath It sounds like I am preaching doom and gloom, but what I'm saying is, here a hundred years ago, 
was the with, were similar words. And even a hundred years ago, we were living in the last days. We are in a time where the church needs to know and understand the time and know their purpose. So this is an introduction. This is a beginning, and, and, and please stick with it because it's going to get better. I'm going to describe to you how in this time, when there's so much darkness and there's so much of the junk and the even persecution and even, yes, suffering just to be here on earth at this time, rather than walking streets of glory or, or, or uh, if there was less stuff going on, it seems like it would be easier. But we're going to stick with it and we're going to find out how to walk in victory how to do what Romans 8 says, where we were made more than a conqueror. I want to show you that God has a plan. He has not let go of the earth. He's not let everything go out of control. He's going to bless the earth. He's going to prepare the earth for this last time. And he's going to use the church to do it. Ephesians 4 says that, that Jesus is coming back for a bride a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. What's going to happen in these last times and, and in these uh, this little series, I'm going to show you how God is and is going to make his bride beautiful. He's already starting. I'm going to talk to you about supernatural signs and wonders. I'm going to talk to you about uh, prophecies that talk about glory Pour, being poured out on the end times. So stick with us and remember this. You have a victory waiting for you just to step into. <laughs>